now I'm very proud to introduce to you about this topic of life that uh, none of us will survive. And uh, we're going to have Reverend Kevin Bradley here to present to us some of his insight into end of life options. It's a very noble topic and we welcome Kevin. Thank you very much for coming. And one of the wonderful things about the free thinkers is this openness to topics. Like uh, I have seen Buddhist monks and uh, Catholic priests speak and uh, it's this uh, tolerance, this welcome. So thank you very much, Kevin. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, first of all, one of my t-shirts that I don't want to buy, but I wish I had sometimes, is to say, I'm not that kind of reverend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. I'll tell you what, let me just walk around a little bit. Sure. Sure. I'm assuming you've seen this cartoon up here for the last 10 minutes or so. Um, part of my background is working in hospitals, and this is a real thing. Uh, and it's just, that's kind of what happens. You know, it's until not too long ago in our history, uh, people died relatively quickly. We have come up with wonderful technology that prolongs the process. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just leave that at that for now. Uh, I'm largely here on behalf of Final Exit Network. Uh, it's one of the groups that I'm involved with. I'm part of the Speakers Bureau. I'm on their board. And uh, it's pretty obvious what a final exit would be. And so um, I actually got involved in this because uh, some political influences at the time, I was invited or encouraged to attend a listening session at the state capitol uh, about a year ago or so about the uh, medical aid and dying bill that had been introduced at that time. And I was amazed to learn. Uh, at the time, by the way, I was, uh, and, and still am, uh, a hospice chaplain. I was amazed to learn that there was nobody representing hospice, and there were no clergy on the committee that was trying to pass this bill. And they were convinced that hospice and hospice professionals were opposed to it. I'm thinking, nobody that I know, and every hospice chaplain I've ever worked with is totally supportive of this. The vast majority of nurses are totally supportive of this. You have to get to the administration before you find people in the hospice world who are opposed to this. And the reason for that is because they're connected to the AMA. So, um, Oh, there we go. All right, a little bit about my background. Um, by trade, I'm a technical writer and an editor, and I do some corporate training. I did this for 20 some years. Uh, approaching my 50th birthday, I had the obligatory midlife crisis. I didn't know whether to buy a motorcycle or a sports car or a boat, so I went to seminary. Um, who knew? Three and a half years later, I have a Master of Divinity degree. Um, but I discovered that one of my purposes for spending all that time surrounded by Christians was to know your enemy. I grew up Missouri Synod Lutheran, recovering from that. Um, and I say that tongue in cheek because I used to say recovering an awful lot, but over the course of my career, uh, I have learned or I have decided that I don't say recovering anymore because I've decided that that's exactly where they need to be at the time. And if that's where they are now, that's where they need to be for now, for whatever reason. So I just say I'm a former one. But when I'm with friends, then I say, yeah, recovery is not, I ain't going back there. Yeah. Um, 
by my degree, I was holistic counseling because it's, yeah, they did the, the Christian thing and I learned all the scriptures and learned Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic and whatnot. But I was always about mind, body, the, the whole holistic approach. So even though technically it's just called match divinity, you know, you, you, like in college you major in stuff and in graduate school you concentrate on things. And my concentration was in counseling, but not religious counseling. I never took scriptures into a patient's room with me. Half the time, in fact, one of the highest compliments I've ever received was when I left and the patient said, by the way, can you please tell the chaplain that I'm here? And I said, well, actually, that's me. Said, really? I thought you were the counselor. And I'm thinking, well, why is there this divide? The Greek, by the way, for the word soul is uh, pronounced psyche, but it's psych and it's the group for psychology. Back in the day, psychology and spirituality was all the same thing. And I'm hoping we come in full circle for that. Now, part of my background is I did a, a postgraduate uh, residency at the Sioux Falls uh, VA Hospital. And uh, a little personal note, my son, when I was having my midlife crisis um, and uh, going to seminary, he joined the Air Force, um, partly because it was a job. And he went to Afghanistan, and he came back with this thing called PTSD. And I didn't have a clue. I had the opportunity to then focus on an area, and I did some work in hospice care, but I also decided I want to spend as much time in mental health as I can. So it's a locked ward, and you're dealing with these veterans coming back uh, from you know, horrific situations. But I also discovered something, that I was dealing with a lot of returning people, my very first patient, actually, before I was just mental health, was a, a gentleman who was there for gallbladder surgery. And I walked in, introduced myself, and first of all, it's very awkward because they want to stand up because in the military, a chaplain is an officer. And I, no, 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 sit down, please. And just IV tubes and everything else. So I had to get used to that. But when I introduced myself and identified myself as a chaplain, he said, please close the door. The man was there for gallbladder surgery. And for the first time in his life, he started talking about Korea and Vietnam and about the 10-year-old kid that he had to kill or in order to protect people that he was working with. That story happened almost daily, over and over again. And they just needed that space. So I worked uh, in the mental health area. And as you might imagine, in a VA hospital, mental health is PTSD, largely. I also discovered that uh, PTSD most often comes with depression, and if you do not accurately diagnose that combination, 90% of the time it's gonna to lead to addiction. Uh, a gentleman here asked about the opioid crisis. One of the problems I saw is the opioid crisis in mental health was over prescriptions for depression for people who were not accurately diagnosed with PTSD. Uh, so today, one of the things I do, um, when you study PTSD at the level that I did, you become a default expert in stress management. So now I teach stress management in the corporate world, uh, and I do uh, addiction counseling and conflict resolution, in addition to my writing. Uh, I worked at Mayo Hospital uh, Clinic System, I worked at Sanford Hospital in uh, Sioux Falls, uh, at Mercy Hospital in Coon Rapids, and most recently for Heartland Hospice. And I actually, I just severed my ties with him last week uh, because of some other life changes that are going on. And one of my favorite things to talk about is multiple intelligences. Yeah. Any familiar with that term? How about emotional intelligence? Okay. In 1980, Daniel Goleman wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence. Uh, he didn't come up with the term, but he popularized it. And emotional intelligence is one of uh, seven or eight intelligences that were identified uh, by uh, Howard Gardner uh, a few years earlier. And multiple intelligence is just acknowledges the fact that IQ isn't everything. And in fact, it's a very small part of it. Uh, there, years ago, there was a study at Bell Labs where they studied the best and brightest, and that's just where you went if you were the best and brightest in engineering, was Bell Labs back in the day. They, they had a thing called Star Performers, and they would follow these brand new graduates who were into engineers to see which one rose to the top. And without exception, the professionals that became the best in their business were not the smartest book smart. 
they were the ones who understood relationships and the importance of, of developing uh, uh, collaborative relationships. So I, I do a lot of work with multiple intelligences. All right, so I'm going to jump right into this. Where do you want to die? It's not a rhetorical question. I want to make this as much of a conversation as I can. Where do you want to die? Uh, Cancun. Cancun. <laughs> That'll work. Paris. I, Paris. The last time I spoke uh, about this, uh, the first response was uh, with my hair on fire on a zip line. <laughs> But the typical answer to this question is at home. People want to die at home, surrounded by their family. Guess what percentage of people today die at home? Less than 15%. 85% of people are going to probably die in some kind of an institution. Now the institution sometimes can be a nursing home, and if you want to call that home, that's fine. But the fact is, it's not the home they grew up in, it's not the home that they got married in, it's not the home that they raised their families in. So as many of you know, we, we'd like to just die at home peacefully, uh, surrounded by our loved ones. But we have done a wonderful job of making that very, very difficult. So nowadays, this is what it looks like. And this is a very common scene that I saw in the ICUs all the time. So more and more we're, we're seeing people, we're saying goodbye to our loved ones like this. And part of my mission is to see if we can avoid that. Um, don't know if you can see this. Oh, the far right, 360, so it's close to a year. So this is roughly how much money, how much Medicare funding is spent in the last year of a person's life on average. <coughs> 40% of Medicare spending is spent in the last 30 days. And I don't know about anybody else, but in my experience working at three hospitals, emergency rooms, ICUs, and hospice care, the vast majority of these people don't want it. We're the political climate, we're, we're afraid of touching Medicare, you know, the funding. If we would address death with dignity, this wouldn't be a problem. Spikes even more in the last 60 days, in the last 90 days. So we got 40% in the last 30 days and down, whatever this is, you know, more than 10% in the last two months. This is where all your money is going, and oftentimes it's in the ICU. And just as an aside, uh, I did work at both the emergency room and ICU, and I discovered something interesting. When you go to the emergency room, even if you are very clearly not going to survive, it's not their job to make that decision in the emergency room. Their job is to keep your body alive and ship you to the ICU and let them make that decision. A lot more expensive to go for ICU. That's a very common, and I know there are several physicians in the room, so correct me if I'm wrong, but my experience talking uh, with those people was, uh, especially if there is a traumatic brain injury, they would give uh, whatever drugs that would uh, lessen the swelling of the brain because a lot of people would die because of the swelling rather than because of the injury. And so they would give a drug that would lessen the swelling of the brain. Well, an unintended consequence of that is that then the test to determine brain activity had to wait until that drug wore off, usually at least a day or so. So I would see a family in the emergency room you know, be with them, talk with them, comfort them, and watch their loved one be, you know, literally patched up, stitched back up, and sent to the ICU. Three days later, I'm with that same family because they're saying goodbye. And then we find out that the doctor will very clearly say, oh yeah, we knew this was going to happen. There's no way, you know, he's brain dead before he even got to us. He was, you know, long before. But nobody, then they go talk to the social worker about well, how are we going to pay for this? And then we have the whole insurance conversation. All right, what are your current options? In the legislation, they talk about uh, compassion and choices legislation uh, that they're trying to get passed. They talk about capable versus non-capable. So capable basically is can you speak for yourself? So in the medical community, if you're capable, you have these three options. You can refuse treatment, you can discontinue treatment, and you can stop receiving nutrition and hydration. They actually came up with an acronym, Voluntary Cessation of Nutrition. In other words, you starve yourself. 
intentionally. Because you, you're done. Now, if you are determined to be incapable, then you have somebody speak on your behalf. And that is either a designated, um, what's the word, power of attorney, uh, relative or whatever. If, if you're married, it's automatically your spouse. Or if you have a health care directive, then that health care directive gives you these three options, but it also gives you another option. Even without your vocal say-so, you can get palliative sedation. Okay? Palliative care is focused on comfort care. They're not thinking about curing you anymore. It's just comfort care. But the palliative sedation is an interesting thing because the whole point is to sedate you to make you comfortable. But palliative sedation has an interesting double effect. In order to have enough to suppress the pain, it also affects your respiration. And I have seen at least three that I know of conversations where I'm pretty sure the conversation was, yes, I know doc, it's going to kill me. I need more for the pain. And the doctor knows very well, buddy, you don't feel anything. There's no way you feel any pain, but I've known you for 40 years, so here's some more. Medical aid in dying happens every single day today, but clandestine. All right. Uh, the two organizations I'm with, Compassion and Choices and Violence at Network, both trace their heritage back to the Hemlock Society. It went through some uh, various uh, changes and whatnot, but today they split apart for two purposes. One is so they could focus, but they also realized that in order to be more focused on getting legislation changed, they had to focus and they had to get the spotlight away from assisted suicide. Finally, as a network is out there to support people who don't qualify for compassion choices. And I'll get to that in a moment. So this is Derek Humphrey. He was the founder of the Hamlet Society. And his story is that he was a journalist. Uh, he was the author who wrote a book about helping his wife die of cancer, Gene's uh, way. Then he wrote a book called Final Exit, which was basically a suicide how-to. And uh, the best way to get New York Times bestseller is to have people publicly protest your book. So uh, that's what happened. People went out there, the church came out totally against him, and so of course he became a bestseller. Um, so again, Hannah Society, Final Exit Network, uh, he is on the advisory board, uh, and today he lives in Eugene, Oregon, which you may know is where the Death with Dignity movement started in the United States. Compassion Choices does focus on medical aid in dying, and what that means, oh, that's just the book Final Exit. Now let me talk about this. Uh, the network, Final Exit Network, uh, and this was at least a year old, so I don't know how many members we have now, but there were over 3,000 members, 70 plus volunteers, uh, all these different areas are represented, so it truly is a network. Uh, the Compassion and Choices, these are the areas where medical aid and dying is currently legal, or where there's pending legislation. And this was last year, uh, and so Minnesota, there was pending legislation, but now that the Republicans are in control, we really don't expect anything to get passed. Um, and DC recently added. So this is just what the map looks like, just for your information. Now, a lot of people are surprised by this. Um, there was a survey done in Minnesota, and about overall, do you support or oppose medical aid in dying? And if anybody has studied surveys, you know you can word the questions to basically get what you want out of it. This was a double-blind survey that went through all kinds of tests, and this so it's, it's pretty objective data. But even um, staunch Republicans, majority still support medical aid in dying. And I was actually a bit surprised to find this, because I'm from outstate, and I have... <laughs> I learned later in life that I grew up in one of the two most socially conservative counties in the state, down by the Iowa border. They managed to close the local Planned Parenthood clinic. That's how backwards I was. It's the only, to show the background, there were two Missouri Synod churches in the town, but one Catholic church. So our conversations weren't 
whether or not you're a Christian, it's whether or not you were the right kind of Lutheran. Uh, I mentioned earlier that it used to be common that people would die from fairly quickly uh, from whatever diseases, uh, heart attacks and whatnot. These, well, first of all, let me just ask you, take a quick look at this. Now, how many of you know anybody who has ever had this? Okay, now really, put your hands up. I'd like to see. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you do not? Wow, nobody. Okay, as much as I am an advocate for compassion and choices legislation, it doesn't cover anybody who's on this list. And we'll get to why. So the Fenn difference, and Fenn, by the way, is my in that word. Compassion and choices legislation that's going on in Oregon and others is you have to be diagnosed as having a terminal illness and having less than six months to live. You have to be physically capable of swallowing. You have to have two physicians certify that you are of sound mind. You have to submit two requests a certain length of time apart. There are a lot of fail-safes in the process. Well, for Fenn, you do not need to be terminally ill by the definitions with six months less of age. We also support research into other peaceful means for, and you like this, we came up with self-deliverance. Uh, it's largely volunteers, compassion organization, or compassion choices. Uh, people that I work with are, are paid on their staff. We do have a couple of paid people administratively. And we also have open elections for board members. So that's, it makes uh, Finn a little bit unique. Uh, another part of that survey was why do people choose uh, to find a way to end their, end their suffering? And I used to think that it was largely here, losing the control. But surprisingly, more people say it's simply loss of the autonomy and, and you know, the, the, the dignity thing that most people think of death with dignity. It's not so much the fact that you may be 90 years old and wearing diapers again. It's it's just a general, the gravitas of what does dignity mean to different people. And so the overwhelming is this. And then this, simply, life isn't, it's not worth it to me anymore. And that opens up all kinds of other conversations. Um, so anyway, there's, oh, the pain control. Actually, I was surprised to learn how low this is. The pain was the problem. And largely because by then, a lot of your nerves are shot, and you can't feel pain, even without the medication sometimes. So when they have this conversation about the pain medication and palliative sedation, I think they're having the wrong conversation. It's not about controlling your pain. It's about your choice. Your life, your choice. Briefly, uh, Faith Riverstone, Minnesota resident, and she has uh, struggled with um, several illnesses, and for a long time they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. But she is an example of somebody who appears to be healthy, or at least she did six months ago. But she knows that within nine months to two years, depending on the progression of her three different illnesses, she will not be able to do this herself. She will not be able to give consent. And one of those, by the way, is progressive dementia. So even if she were to give her consent, at the part of the compassion to rights legislation is that at the time you need to be of sound mind. So anybody with all the other diseases, once dementia sets in, it's no longer an option, even medical aid and dying. So the mission of Fenn is simply to offer free service to anybody who applies for our help. And by the help is not, we're going to help you die. No, the help is to help educate you as to what your options are. Uh, it's a very emotional situation, very financially trying situation. And so part of our job is just to aware, raise the awareness of what your options are, uh, letting people know things about, do you have an advanced directive? Uh, do you have somebody assigned a power of attorney? A lot of what I talk about is making sure that those things are in place. Um, now, 
I don't know how many, are you aware about the Minnesota Supreme Court case that we were involved in? Okay, so <clears throat> there was an interesting case. Uh, I spent some time in Atlanta, Georgia, 18 years as a fact, but didn't know this was going on. There was a sting. Uh, FEMS corporate headquarters was in uh, Atlanta, a suburb of Atlanta, and there was a sting. The Georgia uh, Bureau of Investigation, by the way, it's not connected with the FBI, it's more like the Georgia State Police. They decided they were going to shut down FEM. And this was partially because a man uh, did take his own life, but did not tell his ex-wife he was doing so. She decided that wasn't right, and she knew people. And this is Georgia. So she called her, you know, Billy Bob, Joe Bob, and they, they got things going on, and they finally got the right people, and they decided they were gonna shut down Fenn. So they went after the corporate headquarters, and uh, they found all the records, and there was a lawsuit, and Fenn won the lawsuit, saying that nothing illegal was done here. Well, a few years prior to that, a lady in uh, Apple Valley ended her life after years of suffering. By the way, that suffering came from a botched surgery. And so she lived with intolerable pain for several years. She was finally able to uh, get in touch with Final Exit Network and she heard about this uh, possibility. And she got in touch with the Fen folks when they were down in Georgia. Um, now they're in Florida. And so that happened and, and she did uh, end her life and it was, ruled a natural death, and everything was fine. Until the sting in Georgia a few years later, and they were going through their records, and they saw this communication between Finn and this lady in Minnesota. So the GBI agent who made it her life's mission, and she is on record as having said so, made it her life's mission to shut down Finn, and she called the prosecutor in uh, whatever county it is that is in Apple Valley. And so they brought that back up. And it wasn't the family, it was the state, or the county specifically, that sued them and won. And what they based the decision on was the fact that this woman was told about the website. The woman went on the website, found the book, downloaded the book or purchased it, whatever, and ended her life. But she learned about the website from somebody who knew that she was thinking about ways to end her life. That fact is what tipped it the other way. So right now, you could go into a public library, according to the law the way it is, you could go into a public library and check out any book you wanted to on any kinds of means of death or destruction. No problem. But if you ask the librarian for help, and you tell them it's because you want to do something, and then you check out a book, that librarian is guilty of either assisted suicide or of, uh, um, uh, what's the word when you have a conspiracy. So it has become a free speech issue. So now we're not really talking about medical aid and dying or assisted suicide, we're talking about free speech. And so now the American Civil Liberties Union is on our side, uh, we did appeal it, and we lost in the appellate court. We went to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court couldn't find any reason to overturn the appellate court. Now it's on the way to the United States Supreme Court. And it has been selected as being of interest. So this has huge implications, not only for the medical community, for end-of-life issues, but for free speech in general, because now it's about free speech. All right, I'm going to get into some details here. I want to give you some ammunition. Uh, these are the four common arguments against any kind of death with dignity, whether it's medical aid or dying or since it's suicide or whatever. But this is primarily about medical aid and dying. A common argument is the so-called slippery slope. Um, I've been on the boards of several ethics committees, and it's typically presented as an ethical conversation. But the fact is, there is no such thing as a slippery slope. There is no statistical evidence that proves that if A, then B. There's often correlation. If you've ever heard the conversation about causation versus correlation, just because you give somebody an inch does not mean they will take a mile. They may want to, 
but that's it. So the slippery slope, their afraid is going to lead to an epidemic of suicides. So that's one of the, the arguments. The other one is they're afraid that, uh, well, we want crazy Aunt Sally out of here because I don't want the cabin. Uh, they're afraid of discrimination. The poor cannot afford palliative care. So they're going to be the ones who are sent off on the iceberg. And the other one is people have actually been afraid this is going to turn into a Nazi death camp kind of thing. You know, you're going to select people to die. So the response to that, first of all, the slippery slope. Surprisingly, surprisingly to me anyway, that states that have passed medical aid and dying, they have had lower suicide rates. And part of the result is that, because we've talked with people, you know, they, they've had the medication available at their nightstand for weeks or months, but then they're in their last hours. And they've been asked, why didn't you take the medication? And the overwhelming response is, knowing I had the option was enough. It was about peace of mind. It was about that autonomy. And a little bit of statistical evidence here. Uh, this is as of 2016. So these are death with dignity deaths compared to the actual people who had the prescription available. So the orange is how many people were prescribed. The purple is how many used it. So just to show that it's, it's, it's not an epidemic by any stretch. All right, the abuse, no. Back when Oregon introduced this, we didn't have any statistical evidence to fight the argument that it would be lead to abuse. But now that law has been in place for, what was it? 18. Okay, 18 years. There has not been a single legal action involving any accusation of a greedy relative involved with someone's assisted suicide. So there simply hasn't been any, there is, now we have statistical evidence to say, no, there's no reason to think it's going to be abuse. Discrimination. Contrary to expectation, the people who take advantage of this are more educated and more affluent. And this, <laughs> my, my ordination happens to be with the UCC not UUC, UCC, uh, which is pretty out there in social justice issues. And I gave this talk to a room full of clergy and survived. And one of them spoke up about how this is actually a social justice issue. Because minorities don't have access to the same things. Those with less effluent means don't have access. And the euthanasia, there are very, very stringent safeguards, some of them I mentioned earlier, uh, about uh, eight and nine laws. And it's all about individual choice. There's no coercion whatsoever. Now, I could conceivably argue as a counselor that I could, over time, convince Aunt Sally that she needs to leave. But that's about the relationship. And that's, you know, we can do that. But the bottom line is that our basic tenet is it's who owns your body? Do you own it? I can cite all kinds of laws that prove no, you do not own it. The state owns you. It's another conversation. By the way, if you ever find your birth certificate, I can prove it. All right. Um, yeah, I'm a reverend, as much as I sometimes don't want anything to do with it. But this gives me an opportunity to dig deep and the, uh, a couple of the primary uh, motivations of those who oppose this. When I spoke at that, uh, went to that meeting I mentioned, I was then called back to testify. And I was one of two clergy testifying on behalf of a medical aid and dying. The other one was local uh, Unitarian minister. And then we established a working relationship. The Catholics came out in droves. And what I found out is that the Catholics are very, very good business people. And they're very, very good about grassroots. And they're very connected. So what happens is anytime there is a meeting or a court case or whatever, the Catholics reach out to people who may not be Catholics, but they're part of the, um, the pro-life movement. And those two groups become a very formidable force. 
And they are the ones who are most vocally opposed to this. And they will wheel out the, their child in the wheelchair saying, and they, there's a whole group called I'm Not Dead Yet. And they were the last people to appear as a witness. Crying the whole works. And we're like, no one's going to kill your son. What we're about is when he is of age, if he wants that choice, we're not going to take it away from him. But the fact is that they will do that. Now, so the Catholic Church, their big argument is this wonderful thing called redemptive suffering. Let me see the hands of those who are recovering Catholics again. So you know redemptive suffering, right? Okay. I think of it as like a, a, a wannabe empathy. But the theory is that the more you suffer, the more you can relate with the suffering of Christ on the cross. And I'm like, wait, what? That there, there's, there's a disconnect there. The other one is fundamentalists of any religion. I was mentioning to my wonderful host uh, over the, overnight about, uh, we were talking about fundamentalism, and I mentioned that one of my early learnings at the VA hospital was hearing fundamentalists of different religions using the same scripture to argue for any means necessary and completely against any means necessary. And they were basing it on faith. Medicine is a gift from God. This, this, all this equipment is a gift from God. Uh, all this kind of stuff. Other people, it's not natural. And the, but they were both basing their argument on their religion. And then my favorite is it thwarts the will of God. Any kind of intervention, thwart, uh, any kind of uh, pulling the plug or whatever thwarts the will of God. So my question to people who had this argument in the hospital was, did you call 911? Did you not thwart the will of God? Did you have a telephone? Did you not thwart the will of God? Why didn't you just have God save your whomever, rather than come to the hospital and then tell us that we can't turn the machines off now. So, here's my response as a genuine reverend. The, uh, re the redemption theory is based on atonement theory. And the idea is, for those of you who raised raised in that, was that Jesus died for your sins. That's the bottom line. People don't read it through. How many of you saw Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ movie many years ago? How many of you ever been to a passion play? How many of you ever even heard that phrase, the passion story? It's not about his death. It's about his suffering. The passion of Christ is not, about, let me say that again. The passion of Christ is not about his death. It is about his suffering. Therefore, applying pure logic, if you're saying that Jesus died for your sins, then he suffered for your sins also. There is no religious reason to say that suffering is in any way holy or redemptive or divine. I think it's just sadistic. Okay, now that. There is nothing in Christian or Jewish scriptures against suicide or assisted suicide. How many of you are surprised to see that? Okay. There are six documented cases in what we call Christian scripture, and I don't always like to say that includes the Old Testament, but we have to. There are six cases of, of something approaching suicide in the scriptures. In none of those cases is the actor condemned for the actions. In fact, I was raised to think that this guy is a hero, Samson. Guess what he did? He was a suicide terrorist. He pulled the temple down on top of himself, killing everybody else. He is raised to that of a, he's a biblical hero, but he was a suicide terrorist. And the others, all of these people committed suicide. And there is nothing in any scripture, any interpretation of scripture, that condemns their actions. Now, Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not kill. 
When I got to learn Greek, that was a huge eye-opener for me. Because I'm reading the Greek and I'm translating it, and I'm going, well, wait a minute, that's not what my Missouri Sunday pastor told me this means. So one of those translations is that it doesn't say you shall not kill. Not in the original Hebrew. It says you shall not murder. And that is a very important difference. Think about all the killings happening in the name of God. All the wars happening in the name of God. All those people, if the commandment was thou shalt not kill, every soldier ever was violating their commandments of their faith. And that's not going to happen. Not in that kind of community. Murder is very specifically defined in the rabbinic Judaic law as this. The deliberate taking of another's life with malice. Now, Charles mentioned taking. If you take something, that implies an act of violence. That means I'm not giving it to you. You are taking it. In the Hebrew rabbinic law, and as a writer, I'm beginning with the words, if I give you something, you're not taking it. You are receiving it. And that's a very important distinction. So if I am giving you the ability to do something, you're not taking it, first of all. And it's of another's life. So if you're doing it yourself, this is not pertain to suicide because it's about yourself. But the important thing to me is with malice. It goes back to the abuse situation. Nobody helps a loved one die because they hate them. Because they love them. So none of this pertains to the death of dignity. So if anybody says it violates the commandment, you can just say, no, it doesn't. Okay, back to Fenn. In order to qualify for FEN, you'd simply have to apply. You have to say, hey, I want some information. You have to be a member. We make that very easy. Um, and if you can't afford 50 bucks, we'll figure something out. You need to be interviewed by what we call an exit guide. Uh, several of us are trained. Some of us are speaking, and we're not exit guides. Uh, some of us are. Uh, you have to supply a written, personal reason for what you want in a hastened death. And it's usually about some version of intolerable pain. And you must provide all relevant medical records, including whatever the diagnosis is. Now the key here is, I want to repeat, the diagnosis is we, we do require that you have been diagnosed by a licensed professional as having an illness that will debilitate you. But we're apart from compassion choice because it doesn't have to be within six months. So that's just the key difference there. The important thing is, we simply want to make sure that you're completely aware of all your options. So that's our, our goal. So the process is, uh, your individual needs and the timetable, we'll talk about on the phone. You'll get the information for the various recommended means. And this is not our recommended means. These are the, the means that people who have written about it say, you know, these are ways to do this. And it's always about a quick, certain, painless, and peaceful. Those are the four criteria. The sad fact is that some of the people involved now in FEM are survivors of having seen their relatives choose less peaceful, less painless. I know one person um, very well who's also a board member or was a board member whose father shot himself because he didn't have any other options. Um, so, and the other thing is, if you choose, you know, something that requires equipment, you have to purchase the equipment. We can tell you where to go get it, but we can't be involved in it whatsoever. And right now, by the way, we can't do anything in Minnesota. Our hands are tied because of the pending court case. Uh, oh, by the way, Faith Riverstone, she did get assistance, and she is a member, but she had to go outside of Minnesota to be helped. So she had to then have the additional expense of flying and, and all that to, to other places. So what will we do? FEN will carefully screen everybody. Uh, we provide counseling. We provide support for whatever your decision is. I have personally interviewed many people, uh, well, a few people, who thought they wanted to do this tomorrow. And then they go through the process. And then something magical happens because one of the things that we want to do is to say the best thing you can do is talk to your family. And then it's amazing when their family realizes what's going on, they're more supportive and 
the the uh, the anxiety lessens, and so a lot of the wonderful things happen just having a conversation. So one of the things we do is talk about how to have that conversation with family. We do not encourage anybody to end their life. We never do. We do not provide any means. We do not provide any physical assistance. Make it very clear. Now, I've, I've kind of danced around this issue. There is a window of opportunity for people who are diagnosed, depending on what your diagnosis is. You must be mentally and physically able to self-deliver. So if you have been diagnosed with, with progressive dementia, once you get to the point where you no longer can answer simple questions, we cannot help you. Um, and uh, if you have uh, things like ALS or anything that affects uh, your nerves, your muscles, then knowing where that progression is going is just information that we think you should have. Well, people sometimes ask me, well, wait a minute, aren't you a hospice chaplain? And well, why are you encouraging people to do this? Surprisingly, since Oregon's medical aid in dying became legal, hospice participation has increased. More and more hospice professionals are recognized that this is simply an option. Having the medication available on a psychological level is palliative care because it provides comfort. And so there's absolutely no conflict between uh, death with dignity by any means and hospice. The other thing is, uh, one of you asked earlier about the Catholic Church uh, and their involvement in how they own hospitals. Now, I don't know about Duluth, uh, but I know a lot of major cities, several nonprofit hospitals are owned by the Catholic Church. The two major hospitals in Falls are Sanford and Avira. Avira is owned by the Catholic Church, therefore you cannot get an abortion there, and you cannot have this conversation there. Now, what other people don't realize or don't know, and it's, it's kind of a bizarre twist, an unintended consequence of the the Catholic uh, pedophile scandals, the church is losing a lot of money, they're losing lawsuits right and left. Well, guess what they're doing with that money? They're buying hospitals. They're buying clinics. They're buying nursing homes. Because that's the age bracket that's growing. That's where the money is. So even if you are involved, even if you have insurance or anything that says you're going to be cared for by these people and they know you and your health care director says, I want this option, tomorrow that option may not be available because now they're owned by the Catholic Church. It's just something to be aware of for you and your loved ones. So if they change owners and management, your health care director may not be honored. Uh, I mentioned the laws. Uh, there was a there was a lawsuit in Arizona that we won. The one in Georgia we won. Minnesota that's that's ongoing. So here's the book, Final Exit. Uh, if you want to read more about that, there's also another great book I recommend. It's just called To Die Well: Your Right to Comfort, Calm, and Choice in the Last Days of Life. Uh, this I just think this is one of the better written books, and it happens to have been written by two medical doctors. So there's a lot of good information there. Uh, this is the website for Final Exit Network. You can go and read all about who we are, what we do. Uh, when I was working in the emergency room uh, at Mercy Hospital, I learned that even if you have a, an advanced care directive, if you're visiting from out of town, they don't know you. You may not have what you want taken care of. Uh, so there's an organization called the uh, U.S. Living Will Registry, and it's all online. One of, we've partnered with them. I say we, FEN has partnered with them. So if you become a member of, of FEN, uh, you automatically get membership in the Living World Registry. And it's like being a donor on your driver's license. I can guarantee you one of the first things they do in the emergency room is go through your wallet. Because they want to find out who to call and are you a donor. Well now, if you are a member of the U.S. Living World Registry, it says right here, click on this website and you can read my advanced care directive. You have no excuse that you couldn't find my sister because it's right here. So I'm a member of this, and it simply allows you to do that. Many people do not become members of FEN until they need our services. Quite frankly, what we want more than anything else is people who don't need our services to become members, because membership has a, a, an incentive. You tend to become more knowledgeable. And then what I, my personal goal, I don't care if any one of you ever uses FEN services again. 
I would like each and every one of you to become an, a vocal advocate for death with dignity. And one way to do that is through the resources that we provide. And that's why I do that. So it's not about getting you, you know, I, I can tell you because of my own personal journey, I'm not going to use FEM. I've, I've, uh, I'm in total denial. I believe I'm going to be either 120 when I die, but I also believe that it is possible for me to simply make a decision one day and I'm going to go sit under a tree and close my eyes and leave. It's been done before. The reason I believe that is because I've had the foreshadowing. I studied Buddhist meditation with a monk from Thailand for six months. Amazing journey. That's all I'm going to say about that. So what can you do? Go read the book. It's downloadable. You can go to the library. Um, I'm not asking you to spend any money. We'd love to have your money, but... So go read Final Exit. Derek Humphrey is still alive and well, uh, part of our board. Become a member now, if preferably, uh, because one of the things that happens with membership, and then you might have seen this a lot in political stuff, is being able to say how many paying members your organization has gives you clout as an organization. Even if you're not doing anything, being able to show your membership roles, the press pays attention to you. And we want press. Because right now, the biggest problem we have is all the disinformation that's out there about us. Uh, if you haven't done a durable power of attorney, please do so, like this week, if at all possible. It doesn't cover everything, but it sure helps a lot to have that stuff. And the other thing is, talk to your family. One of the things I've done as a chaplain, of course, is learning to be a professional chaplain is simply about the little ways to get into that conversation. So let me ask a quick question, then I'm just going to let you ask me questions if you have any. Think about the emotional difference between me saying, hey, I want to talk to you, versus I've got something really difficult I need to talk to you. Do you have five minutes? One is a confrontation, and one is an invitation. At the very least, call me and I will help you come up with some phrases that you can use with your family that opens up that conversation that is not confrontational. That's what I do for a living. 